Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers. Today, we welcome to Public Health on Call Dr. Jerome Adams, the former U.S. Surgeon General. He's got a new book out and joins Dr. Josh Sharfstein to talk all about it. Let's listen. Dr. Jerome Adams, thank you so much for joining me today on Public Health on Call. I'm holding in my hand a copy of your new book, Fresh Off the Presses, called Crisis and Chaos, Lessons from the Front Lines of the War Against COVID-19. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me, Dr. Sharfstein, Josh. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. Uh, Lots of, I think, interesting stories and interesting lessons in that book. And it was a little bit of therapy, too, if I'm going to be honest with you, after uh, a really tumultuous time, not just for the country, but for me personally. Well, let's start a little bit about you, because you tell your story here, and it would be great maybe to introduce yourself a little bit more to our listeners. Well, I appreciate that because so many people want to jump right into the to the meat. And I try to help people understand that a lot of what I did when I was in that role was uh, inspired by, driven by uh, how I grew up. Uh, I grew up in Maryland and we're in Baltimore right now, but I grew up in Southern Maryland in a rural community so I understood what it was like to have limited access to health care. Our nearest hospital was 45 minutes away. It was a critical access hospital. I was asthmatic. And uh, I remember being flown by helicopter from rural St. Mary's County to Washington, D.C. because they didn't have the capability to treat me there. And uh, it's important for the listeners to understand that black boys are three to four times as likely to die from asthma as anyone else. Right. And uh, I lived that. So I understood the importance of representation in a very real and tangible way, even going back to eight years old when I was being flown medevac from that community. But uh, my parents were school teachers. They inspired me to work hard in school, and I got a scholarship to go to University of Maryland, Baltimore County, right down the road from here. And what's interesting is that people ask me, did you ever dream you'd be Surgeon General? The honest answer is no, because despite being in the hospital over and over again as a young person, I never met a black doctor. The first black doctor I met was when I was in college here in Baltimore, and I went to an event and met Dr. Ben Carson, who was here at Johns Hopkins. Right. And that was the first time uh, that a light bulb went off that, hey, you could use your skills to actually help other people. And so, uh, you know, I share those stories because representation matters. And there are so many people who have said to me, family, friends, strangers, how could you work for that administration? How could you work for that man? And when I think about how I grew up, how lack of representation impacted me, how fewer black men are graduating from medical school now than 40 years ago, whenever someone says, how could you, I always come back to how could I not? Well, We'll get into this a little bit more, but it's not just that you served in the Trump administration, but that you remained yourself as you served in the Trump administration. You were able to speak to the American people about the truth that you understood. And that was not entirely the case for everyone, but we'll talk about that more. I just want to say between college and medical school and the White House and HHS, you were in Indiana. Yes. Yes. I moved to Indiana for medical school. And I actually never dreamed growing up on the East Coast in a very democratic family that I would go to very conservative Indiana. But God works in mysterious ways. And they gave me a full scholarship. I grew up not just in in a rural community, but I grew up in many cases relying on government assistance programs. And every educational decision I made in my life was based on who gave me the best financial aid package. Mm -hmm. Indiana did, and I ended up there. And 
Interestingly enough, I um, got involved with uh, different professional organizations that allowed me to meet then Congressman Mike Pence Hmm. and uh, got on his radar screen. He was impressed with me. And 10 years passed, didn't think anything of it. Congressman Pence becomes Governor Pence and he needs someone to run his State Department of Health. And so really short version of a much longer story, my name got thrown into the hat and I end up running the State Department of Health of Indiana during Ebola, during Zika, uh, during an HIV crisis that was uh, the worst in, uh, in U.S. history. And, and I just pause on that crisis for a moment because that was a time when I believe Governor Pence actually changed his views on syringe exchange programs, and you were in the middle of that. Exactly. We had a HIV outbreak related to injection drug use, and the public health intervention that we knew we needed was a syringe service program, a syringe exchange. But those were illegal in the state of Indiana at the time. And so I worked closely with the local community, a rural, um, mostly white community, very conservative, worked with the local sheriff local faith-based communities, to actually help them understand the science behind syringe service programs. And uh, they, it was actually they who went out, went to Governor Pence and said, we've talked to Dr. Adams. We believe this is the right thing for our community. And I think the lesson learned there is something I tell people all the time. People need to know that you care before they care what you know. And really what I did there wasn't public health. It wasn't science. It was building relationships and engagement with the local community. And By doing that, then they were able to open their minds and hearts and listen to what I had to share from a public health and science standpoint. And I don't think we did enough of that during the pandemic. No matter which side of the coin or of the aisle you're on in terms of pandemic policies, I don't think we did enough outreach and uh, and relationship building. So let's, let's talk about the pandemic. You come from Indiana, from having worked for Governor Pence, from having built bridges and you know, spoken to science, even in very complicated political circumstances, to the administration that maybe is not primarily known for its its reliance on science as the primary guiding point. Well, so what's interesting when I was Surgeon General is I put out a report called Community Health and Economic Prosperity. And it was a report that, that drew the connections and links between uh, our investments in health and healthy communities and our ability to prosper individually and from a societal perspective. And I did that because there's a perception that Republicans are anti-science. That is not what I have found to be the case. I've just found that, like, Actually, most Americans, when you look at polls, they tend to prioritize their economic success and ability to prosper over their health. And uh, I'll ask our, our listeners this right now. Think about how many times just in the last week, for the sake of your job, you've not, not eaten right, not exercised, not gotten enough sleep, not spent time with your family. We every day make decisions about trade-offs between health and our ability to generate income and economic prosperity. And um, I think what, we, what I've tried to do is show people they're not oppositional. They don't have to be one versus the other. And that when you invest in health, you actually tend to do better from a financial perspective. And COVID showed us that. Unfortunately, it showed us in a way nothing else I've ever said has been able to demonstrate that when you fail to invest in health, that you're going to have schools shut down, you're going to have businesses shut down, you're going to have people with long COVID disabled, and so on and so forth. Can I give you my answer to your question? Please, please do. I plead the fifth. (laughs) So let's talk about COVID. A big part of the book is about the experiences you had. Mm -hmm. And to bring people back, this was a time when for, for a long time the president was pretty much hoping publicly that this whole thing would go away. There were moments when the president was advocating for things that were plainly ridiculous or, you know, not serious in terms of a response to COVID. And you were appearing regularly, urging people to either get vaccinated when that time came or protect themselves in different ways. What was that experience like? It was very, very emotionally jarring for me. And the thing that was the most emotionally jarring, and I talk about it in the book, is that 
I was speaking, at least in my mind, as a physician and as America's doctor. But so often, the questions I was asked, the way my words were framed by the media was in a political way and not in a health and science way. And so I'm often asked to think back during that time, and it was a confusing time. Remember when we didn't know if you should bring your mail in? When we said, should you wipe down your groceries before you brought your groceries in the house? There was a lot we didn't know. And writing the book actually walked me back through many things that I've blocked out. And so that, that, that was part of, I think, the therapy of the, of the book. But uh, one of the stories I tell in the book was in July of 2020, when President Trump said he was going to hold a 4th of July rally at Mount Rushmore. And people lost their minds. And I had to go on the news. And this is truly how these interviews went. Donald Trump is going to hold a 4th of July rally. Our experts say this is going to be a super spreader event that's going to kill thousands. Coming up next, Donald Trump's Surgeon General to explain. (laughs) And that's how they would set you up. Right. And I'd ask you, how many times do you go into your doctor's office and ask your doctor, does Donald Trump think I should get a pap smear or does Joe Biden think I should get a colonoscopy? You don't. But those were the way the questions were framed to me. And what I said then was what I recommend to people as a doctor. You need to understand your personal risk. Are you uh, someone with multiple comorbidities? You need to understand the situation you're going into, inside versus outside. People mask, people not. And then you need to make a decision that's right for you. But it's not my place as a physician to inject my moral or political opinion about the worthiness of what you're doing. And I say that because Again, for, for people forget what was happening at that time. If I'd gone on CNN or NBC and said, I condemn these rallies that people are going to in the name of Donald Trump, then I would have had to go on Fox News and say, I condemn these rallies that people are going to in the name of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery. And because the virus doesn't care why you're going to the rally or which rally you're going to. And so I fell back into my clinician, my scientist role, which is what I always try to do, not make a moral judgment about why you're going, but to help you understand your risk and how to make smart decisions. And I got ripped for that. Axel Rose called me a POS, and I'm not going to say, mm-hmm. you know, I, pe- right. people, people know what that means, for refusing to condemn the Trump rally. Don Cheadle, an Avenger, attacked mm-hmm. me on Twitter. And, and again, the advice I was giving was good, sound medical advice, whether you're going to a George Floyd rally or a Donald right. Trump rally. Now, I wonder, as you were in that environment, did you have your own bright lines for what you would or wouldn't do or say? I I absolutely did. Some of the best advice I got before I took on roles, long before I was Surgeon General, but when you're in these high-level roles, is to have your resignation letter written on day one. And and what, what the person who was advising me meant by that was when you're in the moment, that's not the time to be deciding where your, where your guardrails are, because it's really hard. You need to know what you will do and what you won't do. And one of the things I said to Donald Trump and to Mike Pence and to um, uh, every boss I've ever had is, I will never lie to you and I will never lie for you. And I will also do my best not to embarrass you in public. But uh, if we reach a point where I feel like you're asking me to lie on your behalf or that I I don't feel comfortable, then I'm going to be honest with you and let you know and I will walk away. And so every single day of that administration, I had to ask myself in the morning, am I going to do more good today at work than harm? And every night I had to reassess that. And I will tell you that I can't even begin to describe how many times I was the only, and I'm doing my air quotes here, the Mm. only in the room, the only African-American, the only person who grew up in a rural community the only person who had school-age kids. I had three teenagers um, at the time. And if you leave, that creates a vacuum, and someone else will step into that vacuum. And we're not here to to point fingers, but you can look around the country right now and see people who might have stepped into that vacuum had I not been there. So I'd say, yes, I had my lines, and I never lied, and I always tried to tell the truth as best as I understood it at the time. Uh, But I also felt like me being there was more important and created a bigger impact in ways that people won't always even see or appreciate than any impact that could have been created by me walking away. 
Well, I appreciate that. And let me just say, I appreciated your book. I have read a number of books from former administration officials or people who were involved in the COVID response. Um, some of them, I wish I'd had those hours back in my life, you know, <laughs> the word. Some of them are a little heavy from the policy perspective. Some of them are a little heavy from the policy perspective. Some are a little, little defensive. A little defensive the, or preachy. Yeah. And, and in my book, I'm very open and honest about the mistakes that I made, but I try to give people the context for the decisions that I made at the time, number one. But I'll tell you a funny story about my book. This is true. Tony Fauci and I are good friends. And he and I um, were, were put out there as the sacrificial lambs to mm. speak on behalf of this pandemic. And most people, even though Tony is beloved by a lot of people right now, they didn't know his name before 2020. So, again, we were both thrust out there as spokespersons. And Tony is very professorial if you will. He's a great communicator, but when he speaks, you know he's the smartest guy in the room. And you often leave not understanding everything that he talked about, but, but, but having confidence that he knows what he's talking about. I was a very different, and, and that's because that's how I grew up. And the story I wanted to tell you really quickly is I remember being at the White House on live TV, and I have an Apple Watch, and I'm being broadcast, and I said something, and my phone starts ringing, and my wrist is buzzing, and I look down, and it's my mother. And my mother, you know, is, is calling to tell me, I don't understand what you just said. And so I had to constantly phrase what I was saying as if my mother was listening, because she usually was, and she would call me out if she didn't understand. Right. And so I spoke very plainly. I like to speak in stories. I like people to to understand what I'm saying and not to try to blow them away with, with, with scientific words or by making them think I'm the smartest person in the room, but by, again, making them understand that I care about them and that, that I want what's best for them. Let me ask you this question. When you did a good job, would your mom call you sometimes? My mother would call me all the time. She she loved me. She loves me uh, and unconditionally. Uh, my father, as is typical in many relationships, no matter what I did, always had some advice for how to do it better. But uh, you best believe that if I did something that my mother uh, didn't approve of, she she'd call me out. That's good. I when. I had the opportunity to go on TV. I would always get a call from my mom. And basically the bottom line is, you know, keep working at it. Maybe there'll be another pandemic and you'll be able to do a good job. (laughs) Well, um, one more quick funny story that's in the book. My mother came to the White House one time and uh, we took a picture with Donald Trump. And my mother literally refused to speak to him or even look at him. And I have this picture in my basement right now of my mother and Donald Trump and Melania Trump and my whole family. And my mother is scowling and looking away from him. And I tell that because it shows you the challenges of being in this role. At a moment that that for many people would have been the proudest of their life, you're being honored at the White House. Your mother's there watching you. Uh, your mother, who, who, who didn't go to college, is, is watching you being honored as a doctor. And uh, she can't even bear to smile in the photo because of her political disdain right. for, for the president. I was dealing with this not just in the public eye. I was dealing with this at home right. and with my family. There's a moment in the book where you um, are on the phone with Jesse Jackson and you call your mom. Yes, yes. So, again, a lot of people— only remember seeing me standing next to Donald Trump. But I worked hard to engage with the NAACP, with Jesse Jackson, uh, with Oprah Winfrey, with figures who I felt would help me connect with communities that are that are marginalized. And, and I call them, all of those folks friends now. And the funny Jesse Jackson story was that uh, Jesse Jackson and I were working to increase awareness about COVID in the African-American community in early 2020, because a lot of people forget that in early 2020, this hit China, then it hit Italy, then it hit Seattle, Washington in the United States, and many uh, African Americans didn't think that COVID was going to impact them. Right. And so I worked with the NAACP and Jesse Jackson, and Jesse Jackson and I were talking on the phone, and I said, my mother loves you, absolutely loves you, and he said, well, call her up. So we called my mother up and conferenced her in, and she about lost her mind. I think that was the greatest highlight of my time as Surgeon General was uh, her getting to uh, speak on the phone with Jesse Jackson. So thank you, thank you, Reverend Jackson, for that moment, because you got me some major points with Mama. I want to go back to 
this idea that you were talking to the American people. And it's hard for me to think of anyone in our field who can do a better job talking to the American people across political divides. You can talk to not just Democrats, but liberals. You can talk to not just Republicans, but conservatives. You'll go into any room. You'll, you know, strike up a conversation and you'll try to find that, that common connection. You talked about your report on, on economics. On the one hand, it's a compliment to say you're one of the people who can do that. But at the same time, you're one of the few people who can do that. It's not something that is really widespread. And it's one reason why public health and health in general is really suffering in this country. Yes. And so I, I wonder if you can speak to your experience doing that. How are you able to do that? What do you bring to those conversations? Well, I was blessed in a number of ways. Both my parents are school teachers. And when you're a school teacher, you've got to take care of rich kids, poor kids, black kids, white kids, Republicans, Democrats. And so I saw my parents model that throughout my life, uh, that they had to be able to speak with children and parents uh, from across the aisle and make a connection with them in a very real way. So that's number one. But number two, and I say this to any uh, younger people listening, and when I say younger, I mean teenagers, uh, uh, young adults. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is by Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And what he was saying there is that when you can see the world through someone else's eyes and by traveling to where they are, um, it opens you up to, to ideas that you might not previously have considered. And I've been blessed. I've lived in Africa. I've lived in, in Europe. I've lived in Boston, Massachusetts. I've lived in Laredo, Texas. Uh, I often tell folks I got my master's in public health at Berkeley. And when I was there, they thought I was a tea partier. And then I moved back to Indiana and they thought I was a socialist. And I was the exact same person. Right. But, but that said, in all of those places where I've lived, I've had neighbors. And I've been to my neighbors' houses and we've had barbecues. We've shared meals and broken bread together. And at the end of the day, all of those people wanted the same thing. They wanted to be healthy, to be happy, and to see their family prosper. And they may see different pathways to get there, but uh, at the end of the day, we all want the same things. And we live in a world now where media, especially social media, preys on, on our differences. But I always try to remember that there is more that we share in common than what there ever could be that separates us as humans and if you just remember that and take the time, make the commitment to find those commonalities, then you'll more often than not be able to have a, at least a conversation with folks, even if you may disagree on a particular topic. Let me talk about the, the policy analog of that, because Indiana has done something interesting, which is bring people together over the course of time through a commission set up by the governor to talk about the fundamental capabilities of public health, not the most controversial pronouncements of public health, but the fundamental capabilities of public health, and actually achieved a fair amount of consensus around those. And the result was a major investment in public health. Do you think that that's a promising approach to maybe resettling things after the pandemic and trying to get a broader base of support for advancing health in this country? Well, we talked about this earlier. In Indiana, increased public health funding by 1,500%, a conservative state at a time when most other red states, if you will, are cutting public health funding. And uh, the question is, how did we do that? And this has been a, a multi-year process. So I was state health commissioner, and as I mentioned, I very much focused on working with the business community and helping them understand the business case for health. And then Dr. Box took over after me and was health commissioner during the pandemic, and they really focused a lot of their pandemic policy on how do we find that middle ground between keeping places open when we can, but also keeping people safe. It was a very practical approach to the pandemic. It wasn't this binary all or none that, that we often hear about in public health discussions. And Indiana's motto is, we're a state that works. They, they've done a really good job of attracting businesses to, to move there. But here's the problem. We now are facing a workforce crisis across the country. And places that can support a educated and healthy workforce are going to be much more likely to be attractive to businesses. And that was what they did in Indiana. They really made the workforce case for 
public health. If you have a place where infant mortality rates and maternal mortality rates are high, young families aren't going to want to move there, or people thinking about starting a family aren't going to want to move there. Uh, If pollution rates are high, then people who have asthma aren't going to want to move there. And so they made that business case, and the business community really supported this legislation as much as anybody, which is different than what you're seeing in other states where, again, public health is being pitted against business. And that's how they were able to get and this funding, uh, over $250 million devoted to public health. One more thing that I would say, going back to people need to know that you care before they care what you know. They gave a lot of local control over how this funding was going to be spent. They created guardrails and said it, it has to be spent on a menu that consists of these items that we know are all going to promote public health. But they gave the local communities flexibility on how to move forward. And, and we, we are, we're getting wonky here, but, but I think it comes back to understanding what people's priorities are and speaking to their priorities. And no matter whether you're Democrat or Republican, black or white, you want to be able to be able to support your family. You want safe housing. Um, you want good schools. And uh, when you can show that you're supporting those things, you're going to be able to actually resonate with folks. And it goes back to relationship building and respect. And by building those relationships, and, and I've talked with the chairs of the Public Health Commission in Indiana, and they, they emphasize that they took a lot of time and went all over the state just listening, just listening to people and hearing their concerns before they actually put out legislation. And by doing that, by showing people that they cared, people then cared what they knew. Dr. Jerome Adams, congratulations on the book, and thank you so much for joining us in Public Health on Call. Thank you. It's out. It's available now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or any place books are sold. And uh, I hope people get a chance to read it. I hope they enjoy the stories in it. And most of all, I hope we can get to a place where we're doing better in the future than what we've done in the past. Public Health on Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Philip Porter, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Fernandez and Shian Briscoe. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening. Thank you.